This story involves Elvis's live-in girlfriend, two jealous sisters, a real bona fide cat fight, and Elvis going completely off the hook wild man ballistic in a frenzied fit of rage so extreme that it took three grown men to restrain him. The ensuing collateral damage was so substantial it can be clearly evidenced in one of Elvis's films that he was shooting at the time, if you know where to look. Fasten your seatbelts. It's about to get real. It's a true story, and I'd like to share the story with you. The only thing is, the story is too crazy to be believed. Elvis has an incredible fan base. As much as they adored him, Elvis really loved and respected his fans, whom he attributed much of his success. Something Elvis told his fans from the stage at the end of his closing show in Las Vegas on September 6, 1971, says it best. Elvis once told his uncle Vester, the head of security and gatekeeper at his Graceland home, Now you be good to those cats, Uncle Vester. They put me up on that hill. Now how many megastars of much lesser fame and popularity than Elvis, to this day, would spend as much time personally mixing it up with his fans as Elvis did? Well, today we're going to discuss a little-known true event that takes Elvis mixing it up with his fans to a whole new level. We're going to explore a bizarre incident that happened back in 1966, and trust me, this is going to blow your mind. I can't believe it either. It all started many years earlier, outside the Presley's Autobahn Drive home in Memphis, Tennessee, at the start of his career in the 1950s. Elvis's local fans would congregate outside the front of his house, and when Elvis wasn't on the road touring, he'd often visit with fans who gathered at his gates. He would graciously pose for photos and sign autographs right in front of his private residence. This was actually the start of a mutual love affair that Elvis had with his fans that would continue on at other homes throughout the rest of his life and career. When Elvis wasn't home, his parents would occasionally visit with fans who gathered outside the house. His mother was even known to occasionally bring them out plates of freshly baked homemade cookies. Some they would even invite inside, if you can believe it, and give them a tour of the house. I mean, can you just imagine chewing the fat with Gladys Presley about her famous son over a plate of piping hot snickerdoodles and a cup of butch, as she would take you to his bedroom, proudly show you the bed he sleeps when he's not on the road? Yeah, that really happened. And in case you didn't know it, Butch is the name that Elvis and his mother called Milk. They had their own special language of pet names for things like sooties for feet. Elvis affectionately referred to his mother as Satnin. Uh, 
Uh, did you by chance get a chance to see the parade today? No, sir, we didn't get here in time to see that. We was being told about that. But Fiona walked home and was eating dinner. Yes, ma'am. That was what a nice parade they had. And I wish then that we'd have got here in time. Oh, we didn't. Was. It was terrific. And everyone was having such a fine time. And I, I know that you saw you missed it. And I know that you've heard it was a wonderful parade. Well, I'm sure that you know that the whole town is just wide open to the Presley family. And Thank you very much. Thank you. We, we appreciate, appreciate it. Elvis graduated from his status of local hometown celebrity and quickly transitioned into national stardom in 1956 after his television appearances on popular shows with famous television personalities such as the Dorsey Brothers, Milton Berle, High Gardner, Steve Allen, and Ed Sullivan. Elvis. His 1956 film Love Me Tender was the first of 33 and instantly catapulted Elvis into worldwide fame. Let me, let me have another dance with you. Love me tender, love me dear. From that point, there was no looking back for him. Everything about his life was substantially different from just a few years prior and drastically different from the humble origins of his family's early years. From a two-room shotgun shack in Tupelo where he was born in poverty, to the public housing facility in Memphis, to his very own home on Audubon Drive and then eventually a stately southern mansion called Graceland in Memphis. Elvis Presley's life story is one of the greatest rags to riches sagas ever told. And many comprehensive variations of that story can easily be found most anywhere you look, but not here. Holy fellas, that don't move me. Let's get real, real gone for a change. You know the legend. Here we discuss the man behind the image. So back to the story. The move to Graceland in 1957 offered much more security from the increasing number of fans, but Elvis still took time to come out and visit with them for most of the rest of his life over the following 20 years. I've always treated people uh, just like the, I would like to be treated myself. I consider other people's feelings. I don't, uh, I don't assume the attitude of get these people out of here. Uh, you, you know, like I have heard of being done, and uh, I don't, I don't uh, just sign the autographs and the pictures and so forth uh, to help my popularity or to uh, to make them like me. You know. I do it because I know that, that that they're sincere, and and they see you, and they want an autograph to take home. They got an autograph book. Uh, they've got their little camera and everything, so uh, you have to know that. Now try to wrap your head around all this. It's about to get good. The picture that I'm painting for you here now is an insider's look into the world of first-hand Elvis encounters, as told to me personally by the fans who were there when it all took place. The lucky few who would sometimes regularly get to see Elvis in the flesh, standing on the ground right next to them. No makeup and props like in the movies, no sequence jumpsuits and capes high up on a stage with high-tech lighting and a 30-piece ensemble behind him. I'm talking about a man, just as mortal as you and me, who may have just come from the dinner table after eating pork chops and collard greens with his family, before rubbing his belly, belching and deciding to go out and shoot the breeze with some of his fans. Ironically enough, that man just happened to be the extraordinarily handsome king of rock and roll slash international film star known around the world merely by his first name. In Memphis, the fans would see him as he came and went through his famous Graceland Gates and ran around the city just like any other Memphis resident, only driving a much nicer car as you can imagine, usually accompanied by a pack of friends and bodyguards. Although many times he'd come to the gates and visit with fans all by himself. Then there were Elvis's many California homes where he periodically resided for extended periods that were necessary when making films in Hollywood. 
The fans would also see Elvis at the gates regularly as he came and went from his homes in California, between his shooting schedule at Paramount Studios. These included homes in Bel Air on Perugia Way, where he entertained the Beatles on one historic night in music history. Elvis' homes at various times were on Bellagio Road, Rocca Place, Montevale Drive in Homeby Hills, and a well-known home on Hillcrest Avenue in Beverly Hills. Also, Elvis had two different homes in Palm Springs, but it is the house on Rocca Place where this story takes place today. Unlike many of Elvis's later California homes, the Rocca House was situated with the front gate a good distance from the house that was at the end of a long driveway. There was a buzzer and intercom system outside the gated entrance to Elvis's property. Fans would learn Elvis's shooting schedule and try to make sure they were there when he left for the studio in the morning and when he arrived back home later that evening. I mean, these were some loyal fans who were dedicated and thank God for them because many of the candid photos that appear in books and documentaries to this day were taken by many of those diehard fans. One of the loyal fans who used to see Elvis at the gates of his homes in the 1960s was Sandy Miller. Sandy later became a friend to Elvis and a regularly invited guest to Elvis's many California homes. She also was on the sets of his films as well as his private suite during his Las Vegas engagements. Hello, Sandy. But in 1966, Sandy was just another starstruck fan who gathered at the gates of his California home and hopes to see Elvis in person. When we first started going up, my roommate and I, when we first started going up to the house, this would be in the 60s, at the Rocca house, um, we didn't really know him other than he'd up in his car, always talk to everybody. Uh, in fact, for the longest time, we never saw his body. He just stayed in the car and he rolled on the window, he talked, we'd take photos, he'd joke, um, we'd ask, you know, how was the movie today? You know, what did you do? And he'd always make some snappy little snide remark like, oh, today I sang to a bird. <laughs> he'd just make fun of the movies and then he'd go in the house and that was kind of the extent of it. With exception of Elvis's later Palm Springs homes, the California fans regularly gathered at the gates of Elvis's Los Angeles area homes. And just like always, when Elvis came and went from his homes, the fans were usually there. Word spread within the group of fans when Elvis was in town making films in Hollywood, and rarely did Elvis come and go when there weren't eager fans waiting to get a glimpse of him and hopefully snap a photograph as he drove through. On many occasions, Elvis would stop the car and chat and sometimes later walk back to the gate and pose for photos and sign autographs. Again, it's important to understand how impressive this is for any star, much less the most popular rock star slash movie star slash sex symbol on the planet, and at the height of his career nonetheless. It's been said that within just about any group of people, everyone knows someone who's an idiot. If you don't, well, then you're most likely the idiot. Having said that, the combination of human nature and the odds of probability both dictate whenever you get that many different people with a wide variety of backgrounds together coming to the gates of your home for that many years, there's bound to be a few with irrational behavior that undoubtedly has the great potential to spur some bizarre incidents. There's been too many weird things happening to me lately. And although Elvis was most definitely a chick magnet, Many of those who were at the gates back then, well, let's just say the butter had definitely slid off their dish. Sometimes.
Sometimes that's all one needs to know. Enter the sisters Mary and Marion. Ironically enough, they had visited the gates along with other fans since the early 1960s. Mary had even attended some of the parties inside the house when Elvis lived on Perugia Way before moving to the Rocca house. So Elvis and the guys all knew them both fairly well. Marion, the more boisterous of the two, was well known among the Gate fans by her self-proclaimed nickname, Tiny. Just look at the expression on Elvis's face while standing next to him. I could only imagine what was going through his mind at the time. Why me, Lord? It was Tiny whose belligerent behavior, in combination with her unfiltered pie hole, that started the surreal chain of events that were to follow. You have to remember that back then, it was a totally different world. I mean, it wasn't really considered ethical for people to live together outside of marriage. And, uh, you know, even Frank Sinatra, back in his early days, was arrested on a morals charge. And his crime was having sex with a woman outside of wedlock. So you have to keep that in perspective, even though this was several years later. In 1966, Elvis was still unmarried, although his future wife Priscilla Beaulieu had been his living girlfriend for the previous four years. If you don't pop the big question, they can't get the big answer. It was always talk of marriage and the relationship, so I, I just didn't know when. And I actually liked not being married because um, everything was always, it went so well. I mean, there was, and at that time, there was pressure. There was a lot of pressure because you did not live together at that time, you know. Although Elvis would go on to propose to Priscilla at the end of that same year, then marry her the following year, some of the female fans that regularly congregated at the gates of his home on Rocca Place in Bel Air were delusional enough to think that they actually had a chance in hell of snagging Elvis for themselves. Those few conversely had bitter disdain for Priscilla and considered her a whore for shacking up with Elvis outside of wedlock. As far as they were concerned, as long as there was no ring on Priscilla's finger, every girl still had a fighting chance to win the ultimate prize, and they were fair game for Elvis. Well, it was that very insult, along with several other colorful choice adjectives hurled at Miss Beaulieu, that turned an otherwise peaceful evening in Bel Air into a full-blown, knockdown, drag-out, hair-pulling, vixen throwdown. I mean, before it was over, it involved the king of rock and roll himself, shattered glass, and I would imagine some soiled underwear from the fear of God that Elvis put into those misguided young girls. Those two sisters unwittingly let the genie out of the bottle when they mistakenly invoked the ferocious wrath of a sleeping lion. Elvis was an overly gracious individual, but even the king has a breaking point. It's not often that one gets the chance to splash in the puddle of their own ignorance, but the consolation prize for such a foolish mistake in this case ended with an encore Elvis performance that they would not soon forget, quite literally on the hood of their own car. When Elvis was filming Double Trouble um, in that time frame, there were two gals that were semi-regulars up at the house, two sisters, and they didn't have a real big fondness for Priscilla and Priscilla came home one day and these two gals were at the gate and when Priscilla went to push the speaker the speaker button opens the gate this is at the Rocca house um, they pretty much reached in and grabbed her and yanked her out of her car Pulled her to the ground. I mean, they these were big girls, and Priscilla's this little five foot two, ninety pound little girl, and these were big girls. They started beating her up. According to other eyewitnesses to this event as it took place, Priscilla had left earlier in the evening, and the two sisters followed her in their car. She was visiting with her friend Joni, wife of Elvis's friend and Memphis Mafia member Joe Esposito. When Priscilla later got back in the car and headed back, the girls followed her home. Clearly, stalking is defined by today's laws. After arriving back at Elvis's home, as the sisters pulled into Elvis's drive to turn around, Priscilla blocked the only entrance out with her car. 
She got out of her car, stomped over to the girls, and demanded to know why they were following her. Heated words were exchanged, and after being called a whore by Tiny, You are a whore. Priscilla rang her bell by socking her square in the chin. From there, the cat fight was on. As a dust cloud arose from a cartoon-like tornado of twisted arms and legs as they literally rolled in the dirt, slapping, kicking, and wrenching down on fistfuls of each other's hair. According to the witnesses, the portly contender in the black trunks from California outweighed the pint-sized petite challenger in the pink trunk from Elvis's corner by at least a hundred pounds. <laughs> Realizing she was literally outmanned, Priscilla ran over the intercom by the gate and yelled for help. Priscilla had already pushed the button, and once you push that button, it activates the speaker in the house, which means anyone in the house can hear what's going on. And they didn't take them long inside the house to figure out what was going on. And next thing we hear, the guys running down the driveway. Again, this is a very long driveway. Um, and I think it was Jerry and Charlie and Richard Davis. Um, they're running down the driveway and here comes Elvis. <laughs> They couldn't, Elvis couldn't get the gate open. The gate has to be opened up from inside the house. And he was shaking that gate and trying to push that gate open. He was, he was a crazy man. He was ballistic. I, he reverted to, he had a southern accent, but he really had a southern. It just like seemed to come back and intensified. You crazy idiot! He got out of the gate. These girls by now, the Rock House had a hill that went up. Their, their car was parked at the top of the hill. When they saw him trying to get out of the gate, they ran to their car, got into their car, you might as well come out. locked the doors. Well, Elvis ran right up the hill behind them. That's not gonna do you any good. He lifted up his leg and it just came down on the roof, on the roof of the car. I mean, he lifted his leg clear up and bang. And he started shaking that car and rocking it and just calling them every name in the book. And at one point, Oh, now the guys are on his back trying to get him off the car because if he gets to those girls, he'll kill them. I mean, there was no doubt. I mean, he was he was livid. He This was another Elvis. I mean, he didn't even resemble... I mean, we were all just standing there going... Oh. The, he had three guys on his back. And they, could, they couldn't budge him. And they, the girls by now have started up the car and they're trying to move forward. They're trying to leave. And he takes his fist and he pushes it right through the windshield. I mean, it went this far from their face. The handful of unsuspecting fans that were eyewitness to this surreal event said you could almost see the steam billowing from Elvis's nostrils. He was that livid. The frantic girls had not been able to just drive off because, as you remember, the driveway had been blocked by Priscilla's car before the catfight. Elvis's friend Charlie Hodge moved Priscilla's car so they'd have a clear path out, and he told the girls to start the car and get the hell out of there while they still could. As they drove off, Elvis was still so infuriated that he was literally trying to pull the guardrail out of the ground by the road, while still carrying his friend and Memphis Mafia member Richard Davis on his back. Richard was doing his best to keep Elvis at bay, but wound up on an unexpected ride of his life that was equivalent to being saddled to a freshly gelded bucking bronco. Now, if there's one thing that would make even the most soft-spoken guy lose his cool, it's to mess with his girl. Just keep your greasy hands off my woman. As those who knew Elvis well attested, Elvis definitely had a bad temper if you pushed his buttons. Now, having said that, he was not necessarily quick to anger, but he was definitely not someone to be trifled with. And it was nothing for him to flare like a pack of hemorrhoids if you were ever crossed the line with him. Seeing the disheveled Priscilla, her beehive hairdo pulled every which direction, 
fake eyelash dangling from the tip of her nose, covered in dirt from rolling around on the ground with a bird that was twice her size was bad enough. But finding out it was two against one, in addition to the fact that they called her a whore for living out of wedlock with him, now that's what caused the needle to get ripped from the record and the music come to a screeching halt. I will pull your goddamn tongue out by the roots! Too much fun. In this case, Elvis immediately forgot the image of who he was supposed to be and reverted back to the mere man that had always lived quietly inside of him. The malicious behavior of these girls pushed him one red short hair past the threshold of his tolerance level. King or no king, Elvis wasn't having it. <laughs> you ought to shove this smile right down your throat. As it turns out, these two girls were up to some no good from the get-go. These same two girls used to follow him, like right on his bumper. Um, and then they would like get in front of him and slam on the brakes, hoping that he would, and I mean, they would tell us all this ahead of time. We're gonna get in front of him, we're gonna slam on the brakes, he's gonna run into us and we're gonna sue him. And we're like, hey Elvis, you got some wackos here. But we would tell him. So he was aware of what was going on. That's a dirty trick. You know, when you think about it, it's hard to believe that someone as gracious as Elvis would be maliciously taken advantage of by the very people who were the recipients of his kindness and generosity. Like the lamb that licks the hand that holds the knife that slits his throat for slaughter. Elvis may have been a superstar, but as a man, he deserved the same respect as everyone else. And no one on God's green earth deserves one ounce of respect more than they're willing to extend to others. And that goes without saying. But as you will see in future episodes of Elvis Behind the Image, this was far from the last time someone had the misfortune of mistaking Elvis's kindness for weakness. Was Elvis justified in his actions? You decide for yourself. But just remember that Elvis was only human. And how would you react in the same situation? He could get so angry. And as much talent and much love as he had. He had to have that much anger just to balance himself. But he, he was human. He said himself, hey man, if you cut me, I'll bleed. I get in my pants one leg at a time, just like you. Also bear in mind the words of Elvis's close friend and founder of Kempo Karate, Grandmaster Ed Parker. He said, to hear is to be lied to, to see is to be deceived, but to feel is to believe. If someone does you wrong, it's not enough for them to hear you warn them. It's not enough for them to actually see your anger. Sometimes they must feel the sting of your wrath to know that you really mean what you say and say what you mean. Some people need to have a knot jerked in their tail, as my mother used to say, before they know they've gone too far with you. Now hopefully it won't have to come to that, but should it come to that, they'll most definitely not make the same mistake with you twice. Not on your life. They say it ain't over till the fat lady sings. So now, in the words of one of my favorites, Paul Harvey, it's time for the rest of the story. The timing of this particular incident in 1966 is key for us fans, as it gives us some rare photographic and even video evidence that coincides with this bizarre tale. You see, what was going on at this exact time in Elvis' history was the filming of Elvis' 24th major motion picture, Double Trouble. Elvis is in trouble. Big trouble. Double trouble. I got double trouble. I got double trouble. I got double trouble. Twice as much as anybody else, oh yeah. Elvis.
Elvis is on his way. I just can't rest till I make a mile. I've been from me to see Mexico and Waikiki. Now, there's a reason that Hollywood studios prohibit movie stars from certain outside activities during the filming of major productions. Any injury sustained during the filming can cause undue production delays, and those delays cost the movie studios a small fortune. One thing they don't make allowances for, though, is for unexpected precarious interactions with overzealous fans who are bat sh crazy. Are you crazy? In the movie, Double Trouble, if you look, there's one part, I think he's laying on a bed, and he's got his hands on his chest. You can see the hand that went through the windshield. It's bruised, it's swollen, it's snapped, but that's, that's from his little encounter with those fans. Well, I was just thinking, what's a nice little girl like you doing in a dump like this? <laughs> Although the bruises could be visibly seen on Elvis's right hand in the final version of the film when it was released at the box office in 1967, the day immediately following the incident, the studio reported that Elvis was ill at home with a nervous condition. Some of Elvis's guys told some of the fans that Elvis was so upset that he had to be sedated. The day immediately following the incident, Elvis was too upset to focus on acting or the production. And when you watch the film to this day, in addition to seeing his bruised hand, you'll now know exactly some of the drama that was simultaneously going on in the personal life of the man behind the image. And just like any other man, he was only human and subject to the same mood swings as the rest of us. Imagine that. But I look at myself strictly as a human being whose life has blood running through my veins and can be snuffed out in just a matter of seconds, you know, and I, not as anything supernatural or better than any other human being. <laughs> Now let's not forget that this was Elvis's home where this happened, which is a man's castle. Wait a minute, this is my house, I live here. That live-in girlfriend, a year later, she became his wife, and nine months after that, the mother of his only child. The sisters understandably kept a low profile after that, but this bizarre true tale doesn't end there. You're putting me on. They were bold. They were bold. They didn't come up often. Um, maybe they knew better not to. After Lisa was born, they used to follow Priscilla around with Lisa in the car. Priscilla had to put Lisa on the floor of the car when she left so that they wouldn't know she was in the car because they were afraid she would... Elvis would have killed him. <laughs> I mean, he'd be in jail somewhere. Yeah. So he had some strange fans. Not many, thank goodness. Several days after the incident, Mary went to Elvis's house alone. What do you think she had in her hands? A bouquet of flowers with an apology note? <laughs> no, she arrived with an estimate for the repairs to her car from her insurance company. Elvis's bodyguard, Red West, met her at the gate and took the estimate and ensured her that Elvis stated that he would indeed pay for the damages. By July of 1967, 
The sisters were back among the fans that gathered outside the gates of Elvis's California home, just as if nothing had happened. Other fans who were there at the time noticed that Elvis pretty much talked to the sisters the same way that he talked to all the other fans that would gather there, looking for an autograph or a photo. Priscilla was gracious and didn't even ignore them, but she didn't really speak to him either. It was almost as if the incident never happened. Hates like a snake, biting its own tail. Most any other person would have had them on a watch list, and they would have been banned from the property, the very street, or even the neighborhood. But being the kind of man that everyone knew Elvis to be, he forgave them. I'd like to apologize, ma'am, for being so hostile. The next place these sisters turned up a few years later is another place that you can see them to this day, if you know where to look. The following program is brought to you in living color on NBC. Singer presents Elvis, starring Elvis Presley in his first TV special, his first personal performance on TV in nearly 10 years. Brought to you by Singer maker of the world's finest sewing machines and other fine products for home and industry. What's new for tomorrow is at Singer Today. Um, after this incident happened, um, fast forward to the 68 special, they actually had the nerve to show up for that taping, they're in the audience, you can see them. We, we were wondering if he sees them, is he going to say anything? Is he going to do anything? Is he going to have them kicked out? But I don't think he ever saw them. But everybody was thinking the same thing. Oh, oh look who's here. There's more rare Elvis behind the image. Only so much can be squeezed into a single episode, but it's all yours, absolutely free. To receive your all-access backstage pass to extra bonus material from the cutting room floor of select episodes, simply join the free members only section of Elvis behind the image. You'll instantly be granted full access to the secret section of the website that's not available to the general public. Here you can enjoy all the relevant corresponding material to the current episode as well as all others past and future. You'll also be notified of rare Elvis material as it comes available in the future 
and have the opportunity to share your own personal stories and Elvis encounters for possible inclusion in future episodes that are currently in the pre-production stage. Join me there. Though the legend brought us times, oh Lord, behind the 